And hello, everybody. Welcome to Narrative Live on a Wednesday evening. It's a Thursday morning now in Croatia, where we find our guest tonight. Um, how are you, Peter Kadek Adams? It's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much, Zev. It's very good to be with you as well on the other side of the herring pond. <laughs> um, you are, you know, for the uninitiated, quite a prolific writer. You've written several. I don't even know if it might be even be, I don't even know what the number is. It must be like 20 books about all these incredible wars in history. Um, so you are not only a great person to have here to talk about wars, but you're also a NATO um, historian. Tell us what a NATO historian does versus every other kind of historian. Well, I was the NATO historian in Bosnia um, in the, the wars, in fact, over here. Um, and this was when we were moving out of the, the hot phase when shots were being exchanged, when NATO arrived. Uh, and this was the first uh, military undertaking uh, in a war zone that NATO had ever uh, undertaken. Um, so nobody really knew um, exactly how the articles of, of NATO, which had been put down in 1949, would actually pan out in a real war zone. So they threw money at recording everything that went on. Um, and this, you know, this was every meeting, visiting every unit, collecting all sorts of sort of memorabilia, photographs, documents oh, wow. um, for, you know, the NATO archives. Uh, and they had never done anything like that before. So it, it was, it, I made it up as I, I went along um, and, uh, and they let me. Um, but it was, a, it, was, it was a phenomenal effort. So, so that's what it was. And from, from my point of view as a professional military historian, this was seeing a giant campaign massively funded by all the NATO partners, unfold at the operational level because I was in the commander in chief's um, headquarters. Oh, wow. So I saw it, you know, from a really privileged position. Yeah, you don't often get to have historians sitting right there with the commander in chief. I mean, that's a that's a pretty privileged place to be and uh, a great way to view history because otherwise, you know, history gets to rewrite itself uh, over time. Um, but as you, you were probably writing the first draft if, if you were if you were to say that. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you know, and we often say that journalism is the first draft of history. Yeah, um, right. And I, I'd like to think, you know, I, I, I've also worked as a journalist in the past, but um, I, you know, I'm a trained historian, so I, I knew what to look for. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, so, so I was throwing that ingredient into the mix. But modern commanders on a, on a modern battlefield mm -hmm. are, are very well advised. So alongside me were um, uh, foreign and diplomatic advisors. Um, there was always a legal advisor there. Um, uh, there was always a media advisor there. Um, and you would find this for every major nation um, in every modern campaign. So the, the, the person at the top doesn't move until he's got the best possible advice and he, he or she doesn't open their mouth uh, until they're absolutely sure that their, their comments will be in alignment with all the policy. Um, and, and there's no return with an embarrassment, embarrassing sort of apology, or I, I got that wrong. So, you know, and I was one of those because history matters in mm. a lot of campaigns like this, uh, and certainly with Ukraine as we're about to discuss. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly interesting. Joe Biden you know, arrived this evening uh, in Brussels for an emergency meeting of NATO tomorrow. There are already indications that they are going to send four new battalions uh, to the neighboring countries of Ukraine, um, uh, you know, probably just because they're concerned, but who knows if they're concerned about something specific or not, we don't know. Um, but there is also this amped up concern around nuclear weapons and about some sort of nuclear bomb or explosion or something that the Russians might try to, to, um, to undertake in Ukraine. Um, you know, when the West hears nuclear war or nuclear anything it freaks out because it's a very you know it's very very scary um but there are there are different kinds of nuclear weapons of course there are tactical nuclear weapons and there's the, the bigger ones that blow up cities um but how concerned should we be that um you know that russia could actually detonate a, a nuclear bomb in um in ukraine okay well so I'm, I'm glad you've asked me that um i have a message to everyone listening uh which is stay calm this is a, a Russian threat. It came out the moment Vladimir Putin announced his invasion. Um, there were all sorts of implicit threats of if anyone else were to interfere, the consequences would be awesome and beyond your comprehension. All sorts of threats along those lines. Clearly, this was really related to, to nuclear weapons. And then he's been more explicit since. Uh, and he put his forces on heightened alert. What does that mean? 
it actually meant nothing because they were on the sort of alert status they are normally every day. Mm, um, yeah. So wh why am I reassuring everybody? Our satellites and all our all the range of intelligence sources watch all of their nuclear stuff daily, hourly. And there's not a shred of evidence that any of it has left any of its uh, assembly places. Normally in a situation like this, and we see it on exercises because every force, every country um, that has, has nukes exercises their nuclear force and they pre-advertise that so nobody gets nervous. So you know, you know roughly what happens, the doors open, these things come out. Um, because a nuclear launcher on land is, is a multi-wheeled, massive vehicle, uh, and they don't go on their own. They go with a great entourage of other vehicles, support vehicles, fuel, policing, uh, military uh, protection, um, and there are usually several of them. So, I mean, this is a huge, huge convoy of vehicles, and they go off to predetermined launch positions or wherever it might be. I mean, there's no hint that even that has been exercised. That's so, good to know. That's a relief. Is do okay. So this this is this in that sense is an idle threat. However, you did raise one point, which is there are strategic nuclear weapons, which are city killers, and there are tactical nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Now in the West, we dropped that tactical level of, of nuclear capability, and this is short range missiles um, and artillery, even that can fire a nuclear capable. Right. right. We we abandoned all that in the Cold War. Um, the Russians didn't. So again, there's that level that they could go to. But again, that requires all sorts of special kit. And none of that has been in evidence anywhere. None of it has even left Russia. And presumably and they the have the same... Um, sorry, I don't want to interrupt you if you want to finish that thought. No, 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 Zev. I mean, okay. the other, and, the, and, and the other thing yeah. is if you are going to go to that level, then you, you dress your guys up in their hazmat suits, in their nuclear, right. biological, and chemical warfare suits. And... and we found Russians with some, a few Russians, not many, with gas masks, but no one is wearing their MBC kit at all. Right. So all the normal precautions you would take with any kind of nuclear warfare that are not evident with any of the Russian forces that have been deployed, um, and no satellites or, or, or anything else have picked up any kind of preparation for that kind of warfare at the tactical or um, the, the sort of strategic level. So at the moment, that is a completely idle threat. But that in itself is a weapon that the Kremlin are using to try and panic us. Mm -hmm. Right. It's good, important to note that. Presumably as well, people around Vladimir Putin are not going to let him do this. I mean, even though he is a, you know, a dictator, he, he's not entirely in control of every aspect of his military. Presumably there's going to be generals and other people like we have that are, would, you know, would say, hey, you can't, you can't do that right now. Is that, is that true? Or well, that's, I, what, like, see, well no, that's, that's what we would hope. I yeah. mean, it, it, it's clearly not a democracy in any shape or sense of the word, but it is a functioning country mm -hmm. which has tiers and, and levels of command and responsibilities. Um, and one would, one would hope that all of that kicks into place. I mean, what we really don't know is, is what has happened to Vladimir Putin in the last two or three years, connected with COVID, where he's hide, hidden himself away. I mean, he... he has always had a sort of paranoid bent or aspect to his personality. Um, his uncle was Joe Stalin's cook. Oh, really? And so there is a connection with the last evil autocrat hmm. of a previous Russia, which we called the Soviet Union. And he would sit on his uncle's knee hearing stories about Stalin. And as a result, Putin is the only world leader who has a food taster. Right. who's employed to taste everything he eats and drinks before it touches his lips or on a regular basis everywhere he goes. And he also says that chef guy right, Mr. Turn, turns up at all the international events. Yeah. Um, and, and so clearly, you know, his uncle passed him down a few horror stories mm. from, from the time of uh, of Stalin. He also so, wants to be so Catherine he, the Great, you know, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But let's, uh, I don't want to rush oh, you yeah. here, but I'm going to just move on a little bit quickly to just talk about what the other news out of NATO today was, which is these four battalions. So they're heading, this is a bit of a hard map to read, but they're, they're sending them to Bulgaria, Hungary, um, I think Romania, and is it, um, Slovakia. And Slovakia. Yeah. Slovakia, yeah. presumably, maybe, because they're giving it over these S 300s, if that's what in fact is happening. Um, mm -hmm. But but all these countries are feeling a little bit of a 
nervousness right now because as we can see from this map, you know, uh, these red areas all the way down here along the coastline, and this is the Sea of Azov and this is the Black Sea, um, you know, Russia has done quite, well, I'd say quite well, has managed to at least put up some sort of war effort around this this, uh, this Donbass area and all the way leading into Crimea. Um, and that that's worrying people that, that once this is done, once this is complete, that those forces could then move on to try and complete this whole area around Odessa, um, which would give them this land bridge, which would also connect them to Moldova and, and you know, all parts of the rest of Europe. So that is another big concern, obviously, is that he gets beyond his... Um, his current zone of success, and that he's able to get closer to the NATO borders. And what happens in that case? Well, let's just go to that map for a second, and we can see all the shaded areas which are under Russian control. Mm -hmm. um, now, the reality on the ground, and I know Ukraine very well, is that there's vast areas of nothing, um, not even roads, a few tiny villages um, connected by almost tracks at this time of year when the um, the weather is absolutely awful. Mm, um, and so the Russians only control the main roads mm. and some of the towns and cities in those areas. Mm. So actually when we're colouring that map and saying this is all under Russian control, it isn't. There's lots of little outposts there which are slowly evolving into partisan areas. Mm. Um, there's lots of cut off Ukrainian army positions in those areas and the russians control the highways uh, and they control the towns and the cities and that's it so um a lot of my military colleagues have been saying you know the the, the maps in themselves give an indication but in terms of what the russians actually control it's much less than we even see there which is a fascinating insight into yeah. you know maps and, and, and how the campaign is is being reported um, but the reason for the NATO um, sort of deployments are, are to reinforce um, the, the countries which buffer or, or, or are neighbouring countries um, to Ukraine, which are, which are NATO alliance members. Uh, and that's to do several things. One, one is to underline to the Russians in no uncertain terms that if they come any further, they will bump into um, NATO troops and then that becomes a much wider European war. Um, right. it's, actually, it's also a declaration of intent. Um, there are a lot of nervous people in Europe at the moment, and they do need to feel that uh, countries from elsewhere, Canada, the United States, the United Kingdom, are prepared to put their money where their mouth is and send people forward, possibly into danger areas. Um, so the, the sense of commitment there it is there. It's like signing a blank check. Mm -hmm. We will come to your aid um, yeah. no matter what. Um, and we know how important that is to, to these countries, like to Ukraine. I mean, look how important... How much they're begging for their assistance, and uh, and uh, it's obviously these other countries are, are worrying about a similar kind of invasion, and also want to be protected. In the middle of all of this is Mariupol, which is just turning out to be a scene yeah. of a intense, horrible uh, massacre of, of almost a genocide, you would say. Although we don't know the exact number of people that have been killed there. I mean, there are people leaving there every day now. That seems to be like a, a good piece of news. And they're still holding the city kind of miraculously, the Ukrainians are. Um, but this is going to be a scene of utter devastation um, and could be the scene for humanitarian efforts that we are hearing will be discussed tomorrow during the NATO um, meeting, that they might actually consider, you know, an airlift of some sort or um, a humanitarian effort on maybe the Polish are, uh, are suggesting uh, humanitarian efforts as peacekeepers coming in of, over the border. I mean, are these things realistic um, in, in this kind of environment where Putin is blowing up things? Um, and it, at the moment, nothing will happen unless the, the Russians allow it to. Um, okay. And that's the trouble. Um, right. And if NATO is seen to be dictating to the Russians, then the Russians will, you know, completely refute um, and, uh, uh, not not permit anything like this um, to happen. Um, I think where Polish peacekeepers will play a role is in Western Poland, uh, sorry, in Western Ukraine, um, some of which is uh, former Polish lands uh, right. based around the city of Lviv, which is the third largest city in, in Ukraine, really. Um, and that was actually in Polish hands after the First World War. Um, it, and geography and, and culture matter here because Western Ukraine was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. That means they've always looked westwards. 
their religion is Catholic rather than the rest of the country, which is Russian Orthodox. Uh, and therefore, the bonds with their neighboring uh, states are much, much closer. A lot of people in, uh, in Western Ukraine identify as, as former Poles or, or, or from wherever. So there's, there's a lot of close homogeneity there. And daily traffic over the border, particularly into Poland, uh, for people who work and migrate and come back on a, a daily or weekly basis. So you know, quite apart from the fact there's nearly 2 million Ukrainians now who are seeking refuge in Poland, yeah. there are these long, long, old, age-old cultural links. So that area of looking, that, that area of Western um, Ukraine and looking after the city of Lviv, that I think is where there were, could be a lot of humanitarian aid. But the moment you start to, to nudge towards Kharkiv and, and um, uh, Kiev, uh, I, you know, you're, you're going to run into trouble if the Russians haven't permitted anything like that to happen. Right. There's good news around Kiev. It does look like they, they have been able to push back some of this uh, red area that has been here over the last few days. It looks much sparser. Uh, it does look like they've had some success uh, along this whole area here and here. They've been able to, um, it looks like, do a successful counteroffensive. Is, is, that must be very encouraging to, to the Ukrainians at this point. Yeah, it is. Um, it's also encouraging to the, the, the NATO uh, allies who trained and equipped them for five years before the war began. Um, it's the United States, uh, United Kingdom, Canada um, uh, and one or two other nations uh, were training and equipping um, the Ukrainian armed forces for at least five years um, and, and training them on the modern weapon systems that they're using so effectively now. Um, now, if we contrast that with training and equipping forces, say, in Afghanistan, you know, the opposite result w w was obtained. So this is a huge validation of, uh, of what some of the NATO partners do very well. But it just shows you the difference. If you're if you're dealing with a country that's united, has got a strong sense of cultural bonding uh, and isn't riven by political factions, you get this result. But if you if you're trying to deal with a country that that is endless different political parties and tribes, uh, then you get the opposite result, which is what we saw in Afghanistan. And I and I think what happened last summer in Afghanistan, where the country just fell apart the moment the West withdrew had played a very big role in our expectations of what would happen in Ukraine. But also that, I think, is, is probably the thing that pushed Putin over the edge. And he, he thought Ukraine will be another Afghanistan. Uh, if I barge my way in, right. then the country will fall apart uh, and I will be able to take it. And that, that's what so wrong footed him. Yeah, absolutely. I asked you before we went on the air tonight, um, what parallels in history there are to this. And uh, before you answer, I'm sort of going to answer for you, I'm going to play this clip from uh, April 17th, 1961. An obligation to present the facts, to present them with candor, and to present them in perspective. It is with that obligation in mind that I have decided in the last 24 hours to discuss briefly at this time the recent events in Cuba. On that unhappy island, as in so many other arenas of the contest for freedom, the news has grown worse instead of better. I have emphasized before that this was a struggle of Cuban patriots against a Cuban dictator. While we could not be expected to hide our sympathies, we made it repeatedly clear that the armed forces of this country would not intervene in any way. Any unilateral American intervention in the absence of an external attack upon ourselves or an ally would have been contrary to our traditions and to our international obligations. But let the record show that our restraint is not inexhaustible. It does seem like Joe Biden is channeling some John F. Kennedy, isn't it? isn't it? That it seems pretty yeah, close. Yeah, and, 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 and it would be perfectly right and sensible and proper for him to do that. I mean, the last time the world has been to this close to a, a major crack, a clash with Russia or, or the Soviet Union, as it was in those days, uh, was indeed in 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is what JFK was um, referring to there. Mm -hmm. um, but, but 
the parallels aren't exact. I mean, there wasn't a massive war going on with lots of lives being lost, particularly civilians being targeted. Um, uh, and uh, the, the sophisticated methods by which the different nations uh, across the divide spoke with one another weren't in place. It was only after Cuba that we had the, the hotlines, the telephones installed right, right, between right, right. the Kremlin and, and the White House. So all, the, there are lots of um, tripwires that weren't in place that are now. Um, and and you know, satellite imagery, which can tell us you know, within minutes of, of, of what's going on and people's movements. Um, so there are a lot more checks and balances in place than we ever had then. And that's why I'm, I'm also feeling you know, optimistic that we will find a way out of this and it won't end with someone pressing a red button. Mm. This is the... Uh... The photograph that the UB two, I think, or uh, bombers. Or, oh yeah, 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 yeah. The they they high, took a, yeah. This is how they got their reconnaissance of what was going on in Cuba at the time, and um, this is this is you know if this was the last time we had such a serious conflict. It doesn't look that serious in retrospect. I mean, you basically had a bunch of you know of uh, missile launch pads that were being built. It wasn't. It didn't get much further than that. I mean, there was a lot of saber rattling between these two gentlemen, but at the end of the day. You know, there's an invasion and there's some of the things that went on, but it's not really in the in the context of um, of where we are today with Ukraine. It's not. It's much. No, much, but if I mean, if you smaller. go back to those pictures of mm. the, the, the the nuclear weapons, yeah. um, the, the same holds good today. So you don't just take a weapon into the middle of nowhere and, and launch it. Um, it needs all sorts of support facilities, which is what that aerial photograph today it would be satellite imagery mm -hmm. um, would reveal. Um, so lots of other vehicles there would be an outer perimeter um and you know to fire these things up into the atmosphere anywhere either mm -hmm. uh so there are all sorts of of um uh methodologies by which we would understand where they were firing f them from and, and those are the strategic ones and as i say you know, re reiterating, none of them have come out of their, their bases at all for even rehearsals. Uh, and the same with ta tactical nuclear weapons. So I, you know, what, what we're talking in, in general terms, and, and this again wasn't evident in Cuba in, in 1962, mm. is of a whole series of runs that the Russians are using, all of which are, are forms of terror. Um, the invasion is one, but the way they're using people and refugees and humanitarian corridors um, and the way they're taking people now away, which is a very old fashioned Stalinist thing to do um, and take them off to Siberia or somewhere else. These are all uh, methods from the past. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, um, they're weaponizing nuclear energy. If you remember the sort of various nuclear power plants that have been fought over and, and taken over by the Russians, there was a threat to do something nasty with them. Um, and this is all messages to NATO and the outer world, back off, mm -hmm. um, or we will do something worse and more terrible. But they're, they're not going to do it. It's a bluff. It is a bluff because they, they don't seem to have it. They don't seem to have the capability, right? I mean, they just don't. I mean, they might have the capability, but they don't have the way to back it up because they know it will follow. And they, they well, Zev, I mean, you've hit the nail on the head. If they send a vast army of 200,000, which is you know huge by any modern standards, yeah. um, into Ukraine, and it bogs down within days, and they within less than a month they've lost ten percent of it, either captured, killed, um, taken prisoner, or the kit destroyed. Um, you know that is not a very well functioning, uh, very well administered uh, modern force, uh, and the same we would you would then expect would apply all the way through right up to the you know strategic rocket forces, uh, and this is part of corruption. You know, it's it, it's a, it's a state that that is run really by bandits, um, the oligarchs, uh, and at every level. And we think one of the reasons why you know the Russian kit has performed so poorly um, is because some of the money has gone into people's pockets. Tires haven't been replaced, and then you know the the vehicles go onto the battlefield and they shred because you you need to replace all these sort of things, uh, and, and and that hasn't happened. Uh, so you know, this this is where the yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, we, we have always been under this spell that the Russian military machine is vast, it's ponderous, and it's incredibly powerful. Uh, and, and what they've, they've done is they've maintained the propaganda that it is, but, but inside the shell has sort of started to empty 
uh, and that's partly through corruption. It's partly because they don't have the money to maintain this huge beast because things like, you know, Russia is decaying economically, um, internally. And so much of their GDP is tied to the oil price. 50% is is oil and gas. Um, And if the price comes down, which it has been, um, uh, even before the crisis began, um, then, you know, that's much, much less for um, Putin to even spend on his military. It's so interesting what you said earlier about, um, well, the two things you said earlier that I thought were really interesting. One is around the, f- the phone calls, the hotlines. Um, the pace of, cha- of communication has changed so much. I mean, we're getting information now every nanosecond from the, from the front lines. And there's no delay at all. And so people's reactions can be instantaneous. People on Twitter are reacting to you know, almost immediately to events. That must have changed things a lot for the leaders here. I mean... Uh, you can certainly see a very different kind of posture from the Biden administration. They're doing a very um, a remarkable job of releasing intelligence and, and classified material that we've never had before. Um, and it's partly because, I think, of this very busy um, sort of information landscape that we have now. Yeah, I mean, that's a good way of describing it, the information landscape. Um, and, and that's exactly what it is. Um, uh, we, we've been through this period of, of fake news, which doesn't mean anything is fake. It means simply news that I disagree with. Uh, and the terminology has gone all the way around the world. So when the United, the Russian ambassador to the United Nations uh, only last week was accused of um, war crimes in Mariupol, which we've just been discussing, he turned around and said, that's fake news. Well, but there was a Russian in the Big Apple describing uh, something he didn't like uh, as fake news. So that, you know, the term originated in New York. It's come full circle, and it took a Russian to sort of throw that one back. Um, it's so interesting I, you mentioned you Donald know, Trump, or you didn't mention him, but I'll, you, I'll mention him by name. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting that he... I, I always wonder what the, what the plan was there. I mean, was it... Did they expect him to be in for two terms, or do you think that they... Um, they, they just thought it will cause enough damage in the first term to set them up for this invasion uh, in the second term because there'll be so much disarray. What do you think happened there? Well, here's the conundrum, Zev. Um, the big question is, it, it, it's not where or how, but why. Why now? Mm-hmm. Why did Russia invade Ukraine in February when Napoleon, the ghosts of Napoleon and Hitler would have tapped, him on the sh- would have tapped Putin on the shoulder and said, not now, not now. You know, the weather is at its worst mud right. poor conditions don't, don't don't even think about it um the 2022 is a year when a lot of european nations are going to the polls um so you might have expected to disrupt some of their uh election processes mm. uh and at least muddy the waters sufficiently to distract the world when you could then go in with with, with much a, a much easier ride um, the now when uh, everybody is focused on Ukraine straight away. So, I mean, there are all sorts of different reasons. And, and we we don't know the answer. Uh, and I was explaining, we were having a chat before we went on about um, uh, how we are reacting to things on a day-to-day basis, whereas history is written with the benefit of 10 or 20 years analysis, and we simply don't have that. Mm-hmm. And the, the big question is, we don't know why Putin has gone in at this particular moment in time when you know it would make perfect sense to him to, for him to wait for another term of a, a Trump presidency for um, he could have waited for Nord Stream 2 which is this massive gas uh, pipeline which has been built from Russia um, to Germany uh, to, to be certified and then for whatever it is 55 billion cubic meters of gas per second to be pumped up to Europe, um, which is whatever it is, 43% of Europe's energy needs. Um, uh, and once that's online, then um, the whole of Europe would be far more beholden to, to, to Russian energy than it is at the moment. So there are lots of very good reasons for saying wait till later in the year. And the, you know, the answer is, and, and the best arguments I've heard are demographics that be the the Russian life expectancy is getting lower and lower. Oh, um, and yet they're producing fewer and fewer children. Um, so this is the last big generation um, who can go to war on any scale. 
Oh, it's interesting. Um, but I'm not even sure if that answers the question. And my own personal speculation is he's probably got some kind of medical time bomb that we don't know about. Could that be. means that he has to move now or the master stroke will be, be beyond him because he'll be no longer with us. There is a, there's a factor here as well that I hear rumbled about a lot, um, which is the trade routes. I mean, that there's, you know, more and more Russia are just getting um, excluded from being able to trade to these big, um, you know, to Africa in particular, but to other parts of the world, where so much of these, you know, these rare earth minerals are becoming so important to the tech sector. And it is, um, you know, if you look at this map again, it is kind of complicated for the, um, for the Russians because the Ukrainian port in this, uh, oh, I can't get it up now. Okay. Um, but the Ukrainian port, that area that we showed you along that, uh, along the coastline there, those are very, very valuable ports. I mean, they're warm water-ish, I think. They operate all, all year round. Um, and they also, as you pointed out earlier on, the wheat situation, that's, you know, they, they provide a lot of the wheat to the world, but they're also um, a big export location for Africa. And Africa, as you know, is a big part of the earth, rare earth minerals battle. So do you think that has something to do with it? Is sort of them looking for more trade opportunities around the world and to control more of these ports, more of this, um, more of this coastline that is so vital to every economy? Well, if he can control the Black Sea, um, which he can do by controlling those two ports, um, then that helps him uh, enormously. And the Africa dimension is very important because if you, you look at the, uh, uh, so the, the African Union at the moment, um, only half the countries uh, voted uh, against Russia in, in the last UN emergency meeting. Uh, and that means something like 30 African states uh, abstained or actively voted against uh, or actively supported Russia uh, in one way or another. Um, and that is largely energy connected. There's a bit of um, colonial politics um, going on there as well against the West, but um, there's, there's, there's a lot of energy. So, so um, what, are, what are Ukraine's exports? 25% um, of the world's wheat, of the entire world's wheat, comes from Russia and Ukraine. Um, and a, the vast proportion of that comes from Ukraine. So they need ports to export those from. And the only two ports they have is Mariupol in the, in the east and Odessa in the, in the west. Um, there's huge amounts of coal uh, and there's huge amounts of timber, for example. So, I mean, those are the basic resources before you go down to sort of, um, you know, uh, metals and, and, and minerals. So all of that is, is really important. Um, but there's another dimension to this, which is, goes far beyond Ukraine and is far more important to you in Canada, which is um, the, the Arctic Passage. Mm. So at a time of global warming, when uh, the, the ice melt around the, the polar cap uh, is increasing all the time, uh, the feeling is that uh, in a few years' time, you will be able to force passage with icebreakers for much of the year around the top. Yeah, I think they could do it now. Uh, and so, I, 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 yeah, exactly. In, exactly. In, not very easily, but, but I think they, they are the able Russian to get land, Exactly. Yeah. So if you look at the Russian landmass, mm. Russia has militarized its coastline all the way along, both its naval and its air forces. Mm. Um, and there is a sense that it, what, it, what it's going to do is police that route. Um, and of course, for international trade, particularly to the, the sort of Asia Pacific, you will cut the... Uh, you know, the shipping route time, the shipping time, you could shave, you know, a week or two, several weeks uh, off the, the current transportation times. Which is huge. Um, and Russia will be the, the country set to benefit the most. Um, and it will price it so that it always remains just a bit cheaper. But that will be another source of revenue for Russia. Um, so, you know, part of the, the wider Russian militarization of society and their massive spend that they can't really afford um, is also, we think, to perpetuate that. And certainly, you know, there's plenty of evidence that, that they've reactivated all their ice ba their, their bases um, uh, along the sort of um, the polar north. So there, like a protection there, are, you know, there are lots of different agendas going on. Yeah, it is like a protection racket. I mean, it seems like a really mob move, you know, to try and like, we're going to take over your ports totally. and exactly charge you, that's charge you higher approach. rates because that's what we could do. Um, but it, it is also, it explains a lot of what's going on. I mean, there's so... There's so my mind, my mind went there because um, you quite rightly identified that the Black Sea ports mm -hmm. are the only ports that Russia has that are open all year round. 
you go up to St. Petersburg, that shuts in the winter months right. because the Baltic starts to freeze. And, and the same with Murmansk and um, everything around at the top. So the only ports that conduct business uh, all year round um, are in the Black Sea. And of course, Russia also has this base in Tartus, which is Syria, which explains that they're close um, links with the Syrian military. I mean, this goes back to before Putin's time and before the president, uh, before Assad in, in Syria. It was his father who did deals with, um, with, with I think, Brezhnev. Um, but that, they already have a link into the Mediterranean. Um, I so there theory. are much, much wider agendas here. This is, you know, Ukraine is the tip of the iceberg for a very mm -hmm. aggressive international foreign policy that the, the Russians have been pursuing really since Putin came to office. Um, and you know, he first took over as vice president in 1999 to Boris yeah. Yeltsin. Yeah, I think that's uh, it's terrifying, really, what you're saying, because they are trying to find this path down to the Mediterranean, which you know, they might try to do. I noticed, you know, I always look at the countries that don't want to give weapons to the Russians and basically the Hungarians and the Greeks have refused so far to give very much to the to the, Russia, uh, to the Ukrainians. And uh, mostly the Greeks have refused to give them the SL-300s, which I thought was an interesting move. Um, you know, they're, they're part of NATO. So are they part of NATO? They are part of NATO, yeah. So they... Yes, uh, yes, yes, they are. I mean, but Putin has been working every possible angle yeah. um, diplomatically for quite a long time, which is why we feel... And I mean, I, I, I was I, I was lecturing this um, from about 2012. I mean, what, one reason why I've, I've come in so heavily and so quickly is because it all makes sense to me, because this is the way my mind has been going for nearly 20 years warning of where Putin might be going. And so it doesn't come as a surprise to me. Putin spent a lot of diplomatic currency um, about 10 years ago trying to woo the Greeks um, because they're, fe they're a fellow Orthodox country. Right. And if you remember how much he's used the Russian Orthodox Church at the moment, who are backing him 100%, um, you know, he's using this wider uh, network of either the Slav nations, which you know, takes him into almost my neck of the woods, but certainly there are a lot of Serbs who are supporting him. Um, and, it, and if you're not Slavic, then you're, you're Orthodox. Um, and even if you're not Russian Orthodox, you might be Greek Orthodox. Uh, and therefore, um, there's the synergy there. And that's what he's been trying to do. So there are people in Athens, certainly who are, um, their view is ambiguous. They're not quite sure which way to go. Um, and, you know, this is dangerous from a NATO point of view, never mind the fact that uh, Putin has also been cozying up to, to Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, they took his weapon system, the Exanders, um, but uh, against all NATO advice. I mean, you don't, you don't buy weapon systems from your opponents if you're part of an alliance. You should right. buy from within the alliance. Um, so Turkey's been sort of stepping both ways. But at the moment, um, you know, they're... They're caught between a rock and a hard place, but I think they, you know, they're more keen on the benefits they will get from further Western integration than anything that Putin can give them. Yeah, certainly with the current war situation. I mean, you look at this whole thing. They, they, you know, Putin might have a plan to, to try to take over the entire Black Sea, but he is not going to succeed. I mean, it's just not going to happen. It doesn't look like it's going to happen under the current. Uh, Current conditions. No, it current. doesn't. And I think the important thing. I mean, you know, we're we're completely bound up with the war on a day to day basis, mm. and you know, social media and all, all the other forms of communication at the moment are full of what's happening on a day to day basis. But if we step back and take a wider, you know, look at, at what's going on, um, what we have to look at is is the end state. Um, and no matter how it ends, no matter how much of Ukraine uh, Putin takes, whether it's it, you know. It, it, it's all or very little or none at all. Um, you know, he's he's isolated himself from the world community, and that's not going to suddenly end because he stops fighting. He, he is committing war crimes, from what I can make out, on a daily basis, and his troops are shooting civilians in a way that we haven't seen since the Balkan Wars and, and going back before that to sort of the end of the Second World War. Um, and, and you don't suddenly stop and say, OK, right, um, come back now. All is forgiven because you're not f fighting anymore. Um, you know, it's going to take a generation to move on from what Russia has done in Ukraine. And there will always be that feel um, if you're in the Baltic states or any of the neighboring countries. And this is why they're being reinforced by NATO. I mean, if you live in Estonia, where you've got what, a fair chunk of your population who are ethnic Russians um, and you share a border with Russia, how comfortable are you going to feel 
um, for the rest of your life? And the answer is, you know, you're not. Yeah. Um, and this is playing out in Finland at the moment, who've always been aggressively armed neutral, a neutral country. But the, the popular public opinion in Finland has always been against joining NATO, um, although the politicians have always rather liked the idea. But um, I, the last figure I heard now is, is 62% of the population in Finland want to join NATO. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what, what Putin has done is it excited this you know, in, intense hostility, and that won't disappear for decades. No. And you talk about this uh, this trade route along the north. That really must be worrying the, the Finns and the Swedes. They must be concerned about that as well, if all this traffic is going to start coming through here. And they've got uh, Russia playing the, the mob uh, next to them. That must be very Well, I mean, I mean, so there's, there is a, a, a Baltic Sea sort of union, which includes the non-NATO partners as well as the NATO ones, um, who are you know, incredibly nervous about that, mm. Sweden too. Um, but if you're talking about the sort of polar areas, then Canada, uh, Norway, um, and the United States, the three main players, um, and you, you, you talk regularly, discuss the implications, but clearly the, the, um, uh, the nervousness levels have, you know, rocketed, um, to use an fr- unfortunate phrase, uh, way beyond the norm because, you know, Russia is saber-rattling saber not just in Ukraine but everywhere. Uh, mm. Georgia, for example, also in the, um, in the Black Sea, you know, has got a massive disinformation campaign aimed at her, which started at the same sort of time as the invasion of Ukraine. So Russia is active in a lot of different spheres. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned earlier on, and I want to get back to it, is that Ukraine is winning this war because you know, it has been trained and armed by a lot of these Western countries. Sometimes you get the feeling when you talk to Ukrainians, um, and you can understand why, because they're in the middle of a horrific battle, that you know, nothing was, you know, they, 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 they weren't getting as much support as they, as they needed to or should have. But in reality, the West has done an incredible job here of preparing Ukraine for this uh, for this clash over the last five years, I mean, it's pretty spectacular. Uh, the the West has shown up with so much unity and uh, and you know, imposed these sanctions in such a, a fast way, but also the delivery of weapons. It's it's pretty remarkable. I I can't recall a time in history where the world was so unified so quickly. I, I, and I think that rests on another invisible point that that doesn't often come up, which is that there is a massive Ukrainian diaspora around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and this partly comes from the end of the Second World War, but also much earlier with, with various purges and, and so on. So there are about 10 million people outside Ukraine who identify as being of Ukrainian descent. And I know you and I were talking, the, the, discussing that Canada has, has an enormous number. Yeah. So does the United States. Uh, and there's a, there's a tidy amount in the United Kingdom. Um, and so in terms of rousing public opinion outside Ukraine, this is, again is something the Russians have completely overlooked because everybody is is proud to know a Ukrainian, and you know the number of U- Ukraine flags I have seen flying um, through social media around the world is just absolutely astonishing. And what this isn't is Czechoslovakia in 1938, a distant country of which we know little, um, to quote um, Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister at the time. This is a country that many people know intimately well. And a lot of us have visited. I mean, I know it very well indeed, but a, a lot of people have visited Lviv and Kiev and so on um, because it's a beautiful country. Uh, and, you know, the architecture is stunning and there have been lots of cultural events and sporting fixtures there. So all of this adds to this sort of huge well, well spring of enthusiasm and support for Ukraine around the world, which, you know, has surprised us all. Um, but has surprised Vladimir Putin the most. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how it unpacks here because this, how he finds his way out is, is, is difficult to understand. I want to play you another clip. This is from Russian TV. This is, you know, the Russians are being fed a, a diet of we're going to nuke them too. I mean, they're just using it from the other perspective. So let's take a look at what they're saying on Russian TV and we'll come back and, and discuss, discuss it. That's the right clip. Sorry, one second. Um, where is it? This is it. Let's try this one. No, that's not it. This is about Catherine the Great. Let's look at Catherine the Great. It would be a terrible mistake to go against me. 
You love nobody but yourself. I would like to remind you that you owe all of your advancement and all of your military power to me. I own you. I die remind you I waited through blood for you. So this is obviously the very successful HBO series that was uh, last year, I think. Uh, Helen Mirren playing uh, Catherine the Great. And Catherine the Great has a, has a big influence on this particular period of time, or at least this area of, of, of Ukraine that is under contest, and that the Russians are contesting right now. Because she was the one who actually originally captured this area around, um, around the Black Sea that is now in Ukraine. Can you tell us a little bit more about her and about um, you know, Novorossiya, which is this area that Putin talks about a lot? Yeah, I mean, New Russia, the sort of the the area that we associate with with Russia in the 19th and 20th centuries um, is really a creation that's no more than about 300 years old. Um, and, and, and the hinterland you know, was was uh, under all sorts of different influences. I mean, it's it, it's originally Viking, uh, a lot of it in origin. Um, uh, and then the Mongols came and shattered that. Uh, but the first strong person um, who identified and, and welded together um, through through fear, hard work, um, was actually a Russian. Uh, it was actually a German, a Prussian, um, who became Catherine the Great, uh, and she welded together what part, a large chunk of what is modern Russia. Uh, and particularly, she understood the whole business of trading that we've been discussing and the need for a warm water port all the year round. Uh, and it was she who identified the Crimea uh, as somewhere that the Russians needed to take by force, um, which they did from the uh, the population who were basically Muslims um, who were forcibly evicted. So it wasn't simply taking a port. It was owning the whole hinterland, which we call the Crimea. Um, which they call Krim, uh, and that has been in Russian hands uh, ever since. Um, but it was in the 1960s that it was decided to technically hand it back to a Soviet socialist republic, which was called Ukraine, um, which would mean absolutely nothing, but it was window dressing that, that Ukrainian, the Ukrainians had suffered a lot in the Stalinist era, um, and therefore this was Khrushchev, in fact, giving them something back, although it, it was meaningless. Uh, but it was meaningless enough, to him, but meaningless because... It was meaningless to him, but, yeah. but later on, in uh, yeah, when, when, once the Berlin Wall came down yeah. uh, in 1990, all of a sudden it became you know, hugely, hugely important. But that's why Crimea is part of uh, Russia rather than anything else. Um, and, and so it's always been associated with, with Ukraine and its hinterland um, and the major port of Sevastopol, which is the third port of the area. And that was always a military port. But that was where a lot of the grain also left uh, Ukraine. Um, this is what Putin means when he says that the, so the end of the Soviet era was, you know, the worst thing that ever happened in, in Russian history, whatever his quote is. It's because they took these ports away. He no longer had Crimea because that was handed over to the Ukrainians. So they they had that area and he lost a lot of trade opportunities. I mean, the, uh, the economic yeah, prospects I mean, there... of, 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 of Russia changed dramatically because of that. There, I mean, there are two things to note. Um, that's the reason he gives. But the actual reason is far more personal than that. Um, Vladimir Putin then was Lieutenant Colonel Putin of the KGB, uh, and he was the one of the senior men in Dresden in East Germany. That's where he uh, really sort of came to power. So in, in, in at the time of the Berlin Wall coming down, 1989, he was a very important person, senior rank in the KGB in East Germany. Um, that's why he grew up speaking German. That's why Angela Merkel grew up speaking Russian. That's why the two were always able to have their meaningful conversations. Right. Um, but overnight, Putin was reduced from being this you know, very powerful, respected K lieutenant colonel in the KGB to being nothing because the Soviet Union disintegrated. The KGB were powerless. He lost his job, his income. Uh, his influence, and wow. if he's to be believed, he was a freelance taxi driver in really? 1989, 1990. This is what he claims. Oh, wow. Um, that? And that's, that's what leads him to say that the breakup of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the, of the 20th century. Uh, hmm. I mean, you, you might say, well, what about the, the Russian Revolution? But, but no, no. And that's because it hurt him. And Personally. he's then projected that hurt on 
onto everything. Mm. So it, it's the greatest ge geopolitical catastrophe for him. It certainly turned the course of Russian and East European history. Um, that's why he he he, he emphasises it so much. So a lot of this is re returning Russia to the greatness it was, but along the way, trying to heal some of the hurt he personally felt uh, and that, that hurt his generation and his friends, particularly um, in the KGB. And it's no accident that those are the guys in power now. He certainly is an interesting character. I mean, there's complexity in everything about Vladimir Putin, which is just... Uh, interesting um there's also a maniacal side to him that seems to be hell-bent on doing you know achieving his goals regardless of anything he doesn't seem to care about the people that are dying he doesn't seem to care about the humanitarian crisis that he's creating he just doesn't he doesn't that doesn't seem to impact him all he seems to do is want to achieve this goal um is that an accurate sense from your perspective of what he's like I'm not sure any of us really know what he's like. I mean, there's, there's a whole academic discipline. We used to call ourselves Kremlin, Kremlinologists. Um, mm. Now it's Putin watchers. Um, but every time anyone gets close to any kind of measured analysis, he goes and says or does something that throws everything up into the air. Um, mm. So I'm content to sit back and say, right, he's every James Bond baddie rolled into one. <laughs> If he doesn't live in a hollowed out volca volcano with a glass roof, he could certainly afford to do so. Right. Um, and so he is, he's everything that Ian Fleming could have ever um, imagined for James Bond to combat, but really with is. the political power and the nuclear weapons to go with that particular really nasty cocktail. Mm. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure probably even knows who he is, but he's never been pushed into this position. And, and I mean, the, the the proof of the pudding with all these things is is who your inner circle is and who your successor is if you suddenly fall over. And none of us are aware of an instant man in the wings who would come in and pick up the reins were Vladimir Putin suddenly to die tomorrow. Wow. And that's Isn't... the point. He's not confiding in anybody else. There's not a network in place there. When he goes, the whole thing crashes down. There's, there's, there's no continuity in place, and that's there really, are names really people wonderful. keep mentioning, like Petr Petrichov, I think is one of them. I'm not sure if I'm saying the name well, uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, the head of the FSB. I mean, there's a couple of names, or sorry, the Security Council that do get floated around from time to time. Um, but are you? They, they do, the but it's never the same names. Right. They're in favor or they're out of favor. Right. Just before the Ukrainian invasion, we saw the, the um, you know, the, the head of foreign intelligence. Um, in that, uh, in that easy, uh, television program, um, I mean, don't forget this is this is a state where information is controlled. Information is the most valuable resource because um, if you control people's minds, you do that by controlling the data that they have access to. So you have to control everything, every image, every word. It's all really, really carefully chosen. What a great segue um, to this clip because I finally found it. Let's take a look at what they're telling good. Russians right now on Russian TV. Сейчас вся российская триада переведена в особый режим 
боевого дежурства. Если мы снова нашу армию подведем к западным границам, они трусливые, они боятся, их нужно брать испугом, кнутом. Мы э, ни в коем случае не можем остановиться на полпути. С такими санкциями, кто сказал, что надо останавливаться вообще в границу Украины? Сави... Например, может выглядеть сценарий по а, собственному захвату Дебалочки. Да и Россия единственная страна в мире, которая реально способна превратить США в радиоактивный пепел. I mean, it's dramatic and terrifying, but you know, this is what they're getting fed in on Russian TV, and it's a it's a whole different landscape over there for them. They don't have a pluralist media, mm -hmm. so the state media controls everything. In the first week of the invasion, we saw all the independent voices being closed down. And indeed, you know, TV executives have now left their jobs, um, uh, including that very brave woman who unfurled the poster behind the newsreader. Um, but it means the Russians are now only getting one diet, which is what the, the Kremlin wants them to hear. Um, and, and that's in order to make sure that they all turn out as true patriots and they will do that live what Putin, Putin wants. But I mean, this is, this is going back to 1944-45 in Nazi Germany, where, where all access to other kinds of media are, are being shut off. Um, now, the, the, the one sort of beacon of, of liberty is, uh, well, there are two. One is mobile phones, and I'm still surprised I can talk to friends in St. Petersburg. Mm, um, that is good. So, you know, it's, it, it, and, and the Russians have found that they simply can't shut off the cellular network, and certainly not in Ukraine, because they're using it themselves right. they their own it. technology is so yeah. appalling that the, the russian military are needing to use the cellular te cellular technology just to communicate um and the, you know they started to to kill the, the tv tower but they suddenly realized um that they they needed them as much as the ukrainians the ukrainians are using whatsapp right to transmit target data but between you know military units Um, because that's the most that, that's the quickest and most effective, uh, and there's a degree of encryption. I mean, it's just um, extraordinary. So the, the Ukrainians Russians are the Russians that. are doing that. You said the Ukrainians. So sorry, the the, the Ukrainians are yeah. using WhatsApp. Okay. okay, and the Russians are also having to use WhatsApp yeah. as well because um, their, their own technology is is not up to the job. Um, right. But the other the other thing is is we have wound our way back. I mean. All the, uh, the the radio networks, certainly in the United Kingdom and throughout Europe, went digital, um, and the BBC World Service has now gone back to analog because that's the way it can get through to the Russian people. Mm. There's the shortwave radio, BBC Russian service and the Ukrainian service. Mm. So we have gone back to the days of the Cold War and Cold War technology because it, it's 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 far more difficult for the Russians to jam because everything has gone high tech to to the digital world. It's so interesting. When I was a, a kid in South Africa, you know, I used to have a shortwave radio just to just so I could listen to the BBC or or any other foreign um, news services. Because like like Russia today, South Africa was under a complete news blackout. Um, so I certainly understand how hungry you get for that information, but also how easy it is for a whole country to be uh, to be lied to in the way that we were in South Africa, but also uh, how the Russians are being lied to right now. It's kind of it's remarkable how quickly that can happen. So, I mean, you know, one, one, one of the problems I have is, yeah, we're mobilizing world opinion against Russia and, and what Vladimir Putin is, is doing. There's the whole Russian people we have got to realize who are really hurting and suffering in all of this. So when, um, you know, when all the Western companies pull out, and I'm not thinking of the high-end sort of Pradas, I'm thinking of you know, Starbucks and McDonald's, mm. um, it's the Russian people who... We when it's all over to try because a, a a russia without a, a strong dictator putin or you know his mates um is the russia that we do want um so our, i've always said our quarrel isn't with the russian people it's with their leadership um and their their gang their mafiosi um that run that run the country um yes. and you know this 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 adds another layer of problems And, and, and hence, you know, BBC Russian service and all the rest of it. They're the people we're trying to communicate. And, and the battle is really for the hearts and minds of the Russian people because they're, these are the ones that Putin is trying to control. 
um, by restricting their access to, to everything else that's going on in the world. So interesting. I've got a couple of questions here from the um, from the audience. One of them: do, do you know much about Alexander Dugan and what his role has been in 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 helping uh, forge Putin's mind? I guess he's he's called the uh, uh, Putin's Rasputin in that he's able to influence him about all the changes in the world. Um, is he that influential? Uh, well, the, I mean, there's the, there's a circle of three or four. Um, who are really philosophers more than anything else, who've come up with their own worldview. Um, and this is where the the idea of, of um, Nova Rossiya and the, the traditions of Rus have come from, uh, and all the culture that goes with that, that Ukraine is linked in with that, but also the wider sphere of the other SSRs, the Baltic states from the clips that we've just had. Um, I mean, you know, Putin has never shown any academic... Um, sort of interest before and yet all of a sudden he st suddenly starts to come out with these the, the 6,000 word essay we had on on Ukraine in July last summer mm -hmm. um, so this is all the the intellectual circle that they're the ones feeding him and what we think has happened um, is uh, Putin reacted very badly to COVID he didn't catch it but he's paranoid about catching things I, I mentioned the whole business of food tasters and all the rest of it. So he isolated himself from absolutely everything in Russia, um, including most people. He didn't want to catch COVID from anybody. Um, and so he's he's ridden out that storm, but it meant in, in almost you know, complete isolation from other human beings who with whom he would interact on a day-to-day -day basis. Everything was, you know, by... What he obviously has had is a very small circle of people that he's spoken to throughout, you know, the two years of the pandemic. And they're the ones we think have changed his mind, people like Dugan, who are, you know, intellectuals. They've had discussions probably digitally rather, but, but by video link rather than face to face. But this is how Putin has sort of spent his time. Um, because actually the, the health situation in Russia is absolutely lamentable. They've got one of the lowest take-up rates for vaccine inventions oh, well. we're not even sure whether the sputnik vaccine was any good at all but it was you know it was paraded as this great russian solution to world health care and in fact those who bought it uh, seem to have been rather re regretting that they did uh, and it may well have just been some kind of placebo um peter you so should probably let you get to bed in his own country. Yeah. I think we should sure. need to get you better. It's getting really late over there. Um, so I'm going to be aware of your, your sleep patterns. But I do want you to talk a little bit about your future books. Uh, one of them, which is coming up in May. It's the same book, I'm told. You told me. Um, but different covers for different parts of the world. So tell me what people can find in this book and, and why they should buy it. Well, uh, that's, 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 uh, that's really kind, Ed. I've written a trilogy about the Second World War. The first volume was and Steel is a volume about the D-Day landings. Um, the second volume was Snow and Steel, which was about the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, and my final volume is called Fire and Steel uh, in the United States, but the UK title um, is Victory in the West. And that's the last hundred days of the Second World War. So it, it, it's really talking about the, the end of the world, but more significantly the crossings over the River Rhine, that great 800 mile long river that is Germany sort of western frontier um and the last six weeks of world war ii because once we're over the rhine uh we you know germany disintegrates but there's a lot of hard fighting uh, and i you know i see so many parallels and they've been creeping out leaking all tonight how you know, putin is controlling people in the way the nazis did in in, in germany during the, the third reich era mm -hmm. um the way I think the River Dnieper will play a huge role in the coming battles in Ukraine, um, in the way the Rhine did, mm. um, because there's a whole battle yet to come, probably, of, of the Russian, the Ukrainian forces defending eastern Ukraine. Um, right. And uh, it, it, when Ma Mariupol falls, they may be pushed back to the River Dnieper, and we may have a long river line battle similar to the, the German defense of, uh, of the River Rhine in 1945. Wow, so that's in this book. Um, and then the, the aftermath. It's all in this book, and this is coming out in May, so the timing actually could be, um, you know, quite uh, quite fortuitous. It's I almost mean, like you had advance warning. <laughs> 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 Did you? 
<laughs> no, I mean you must. Have... <laughs> it is pretty I am not coincidental. Going to admit to being, you know, the, 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 the secret advisor of Vladimir Putin, <laughs> certainly not public. <laughs> By the way, but everyone I, can I, find. I wanted to write. Yeah, I wanted to write. Um, round off my trilogy of the yeah. Second World War and um, and uh, as it happens, um, it, 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 it'll be out in May in the UK and a bit later on in in the United States, and I will be doing book tours and book signings um, with it. So I hope to meet uh, many of you who are listening and watching now um, in person to be able to chat and scribble in a book with a signature for you. Well, I hope you'll come back on the show and talk a, bit, about, a lot more about it. I would love to. But I should thank also tell people that, that on, been great. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Really great. I know it's really late and I appreciate you staying up so late. I do want to tell people that they can find a lot of your books on amazon.com or Amazon, wherever they might be. Uh, and you've got a page. If they just type in your name, Peter Caddick Adams, you'll find all of Peter's books. There are many and they all are terrific. If you're a history buff, this is one place to go and, uh, and buy these books and Peter's worth your time. Uh, as you can tell, he knows a lot of his a lot of the stuff that he needs to know in order to be a NATO historian. Pretty remarkable career you've had, uh, and we thank you so much for spending some of your time with us tonight. It's really helped me understand. Well, a lot more so, about it, it's Ukraine. been absolutely great because I, I always learn things by the questions I'm asked, um, and and if people want to follow me further, they can they find me on Twitter, which is how you and I first met. Um, and uh, and all, all the other usual social media as well. So um, I hope that, um, yeah, it will be great to be back and, and um, talk about the aftermath of this awful war, because I hope it will finish, we don't know when, but, but uh, hopefully we can, we can pause and look, look back at it, but also talk about, um, you know, other aspects and the end of the Second World War once my book is out and, and being read. That would be wonderful. I, I can't wait to Thank read you. it, actually. You've, uh, you've uh, enticed me into wanting to read it, so I'm going to buy a copy, pre-order a copy right now. I hope that the audience does as well tonight. Um, and that is our show for tonight. I want to thank everyone who's watching. I want to thank all our uh, Patreon um, and patrons who, who support Narrative. It's really important that you keep doing that. It's the only way we can bring you this kind of programming, which I, I know you'll agree is very, very useful. Um, but on that note... It's a very good morning to you, Peter, and a very good night to everybody else um, as we say good night on Narrative. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Narrative is made possible by viewers like you. Join today and support truly independent journalism at patreon.com forward slash narrative. That's patreon.com forward slash narrative. Narrative is made possible by viewers like you. Join today and support truly independent journalism at patreon.com forward slash narrative. That's patreon.com forward slash narrative.